hopefully everybody is not going to just fall asleep here. But so, <laughs> so my name is Sunrise O'Mahony, and I'm the executive director for the Watershed Alliance of Southwest Washington. And thank you, everybody, for coming. This is everyone's been saying this, but this is great to see such a group of people and so many people that I still don't know from today. So. Um, Clean Water Commission, Roger, and Bob, and everybody that's been doing this work to get this going with the county. Thank you. This is an awesome, awesome effort. So, real quick, raise the hands, just as I always like to ask, how many of you prior to this slide knew about the Watershed Alliance of Southwest Washington? Sweet. Okay. Um, so, I'm not going to go into this. You've already kind of seen this a little bit, but we are a nonprofit. I'm not used to doing a podium one. We are a nonprofit. It's that it is in all of Clark County, so we are not just focused in in just the Kansas area, for example. So I'm going to highlight a little bit about what we do as a whole county, and then also what we're doing locally here. Again, just showing some images here of what we do. We are again in the whole county entirely. We have projects that we work as far north as Richfield, over to Washougal, and everywhere in between. Oh, and the little icons are a little different here. So what we do is we have all kinds of work that we do. We have public restoration property that we do where we do tree plantings, we do beach cleanups, we have uh, our backyard habitat certification program, which I need to promise is not ours, it's actually Columbia Lands Trust in Portland Audubon, and we do that here locally. We have our work with private property owners where we do planting plans and then also work in the ground, on the ground with them doing restoration work. We do education work. We've been starting to do more classroom engagements where we basically we have classroom time and then some of the sites have creeks alongside their property so we're able to do on site with the students after the classroom time doing tree planting. And then we have our environmental film series. So beach cleanups, stewardship, restoration, we've been a lot about this today, hearing a lot of recommendations about what we need to be doing to help our, our creeks and rivers, and this is a big piece of what we do. When we do the tree, the, sorry, the tree plantings are from October through March, typically, climate dependent, and then we do our beach cleanups throughout the summer months. And this year, we have, we have a little bit of a, our accomplishments are a little blurred with 22 and 23. But that's just because of our tree planting season and how it works. But I wanted to kind of just highlight in a non-pretty way, but highlight what it is that we have accomplished this year. And yes, there we put in basically almost 20,000 native plants in our tree planting season, which was from last, so October of 23 to March of 23. This is our biggest year ever. To put that many plants in the ground is amazing. Thank you. <laughs> And we didn't round. This is the exact. <laughs> but with that, we took those through volunteer events, and we did them in volunteer events all throughout the county. Right now, at the moment, well, that season, that planting, for example, was right around 800 volunteers. So 800 volunteers roughly put in that many plants. And these are volunteers of all ages, from the kids on the packs to I mean, kids on the packs to I think our oldest person. She told us she was 90. Um, so that was, this year alone, we've had 1,400 volunteers, and we haven't even started our tree planting season yet. So that starts here on Saturday. But that's a lot of volunteers that are getting out of doing this work. We had trash, we do our beach cleanups, we're going to highlight that, and looking at how much trash we've removed from the beaches. This pound of trash is from, some of it is from Lacrimus Lake, some of it is from Frenchman's Bar, and then Whitler. So these are all our local local beaches around. And I don't know if Jeff is still here, but we have also, we've been separating um, a cigarette bus this year, just as a kind of a new thing that we started doing a couple of years ago. And we send them to a company called TerraCycle at the end of the season, and they recycle the cigarette butts. So it's a side thing that we're doing there that's something a bit different. And and we have little, we have little buckets that are separate. And that's where people, when we're not going through and sorting through everyone's trash, uh, we have these little buckets, people put that in there, and then we collect it at the end of the year. We are not literally counting that many, so we did have a calculation that we calculated how much each bucket has, and that's where we came up with that amount. So we'll be sending those in. 
We also partnered this year with Water Resources Education Center and they collected them as well. So we'll be combining theirs with ours. We don't know their numbers yet and we'll be sending them in with it as well. But we're in Camas. So how many of you have been to the Lackamas Lake Beach cleanup before that's here? All right, you guys. There's the, what's the goals? What did you call it, Devin? The, 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 the goals for next year? A mix to clean water, Lackamas Lake each cleanup. So they've been doing this for 20 some odd years. Uh, we've been coordinating it with the city of Camas the last two years and we are also now combined it with an ID removal. And so this year we worked with, oh gosh, is it Tassie but with Ivy League, right? Not no <laughs> Anyways, Ivy League with uh, doing the ID removal as well. Oh and I wrote my notes because I really haven't um, so we had the other project that we're doing is, well, let's see, I have my stats, but it's on my other piece of paper stuff. We did, was it 672, actually, ah, oh, here we go. So the Lackamas Lake Beach Planet last year, we had in 22, we had 173 volunteers, 225 pounds of trash were removed. This year we saw a huge increase in what we found. One of the main reasons on the way here is there's a lot of glass. The biggest thing that we found this year was glass bottles in the lake itself. And so it's mind blowing to me how many people still are bringing glass and out into the lake. But that is why we ended up having such an increase. Almost everyone came with lip bottles. And we saw an amazing turnout. 240 people were here just you know a month ago doing this. We're also working at a place that's right around the corner on the, uh, not right on the lake, but around the lake, and we call it Everett and Ledbetter because it's on Everett and Ledbetter. And we did a tree planting there. It's a restoration, it's a small restoration project that we're doing. And we put in, volunteers put in 154 native plants. All of the plants that we put in are always native plants. So they're putting that in. So it's just kind of fun to see. People have been very excited and engaged to be able to volunteer to tree plantings in campus. We have a lot of volunteers that live in Camas and volunteer in our events in Vancouver and in Richfield and they're very excited to be able to have them here. And I'm going to go through this fast then. Uh, so this is the Backyard Habitat Certification Program. Again, wanted to just highlight some of what it is that we're doing in addition to these other projects that are, you know, more uh, site specific. This is in the whole county. And this is a program that ensures, I have more information about it over there, but it helps property owners that are under an acre to be able to learn how to create a habitat friendly property. It says backyard habitat is front, side, back, if you're an HOA, and you just your backyard. Um, but it's not just that, it also focuses on stormwater. So there's different components part of this program. It's not just planting plants. And in this program here, we have done now in Clark County, this I do have my notes, 674 visits in Clark County through this program since we started a couple of years ago, a few years ago, and we've had 138 certifications, so that means that their properties were at a level of certification in the program. In Camas, because Camas, City of Camas is one of our partners on this, so we have done 64 site visits since we started, and we've had seven certifications. It may not sound like a lot, but it's a lot. 60, 64 site visits and people are working their way towards becoming certified and we have a lot more people on the list. And now we come into the restoration piece which is it blurs with a lot of our tree plantings and our volunteer work because it, it is a big, it's a mix, it's not just working with volunteers. But we also do larger scale restoration projects and so some of the ones that I have up here we've done on Little Washougal River, Manly Creek which is in Battleground, that's through an apology. We have G Creek, and the work we're doing at G Creek, that's the big, that comes like a T-Rex, but our actual industry project is the G Creek, and that's at Abrams Park. And then we have a program in on the Washougal River that was a homeowner and center program. And basically what I want to highlight on this is that our restoration projects are across the board. We talked a lot, we heard a lot today about how can we make these, you know, what do we need to do for these next steps to implementation. We work with our projects are public, private, partnerships. We work with schools. We have some within the Richfield School District. We've worked at Washougal High School. We've worked, um, those are the schools. <laughs> We've worked at the schools. And then doing this public private. So G Creek, for example, is some of the property is city of Richfield, and then some is a private property owner. 
We've had all different types of relationships when it comes to restoration, and we find that it's really exciting and important for us to partner with different groups to be able to get in there and do this work, because it's not simply just one area. You need to really look at the bigger picture along the creek, and you're going to hit a lot of different properties. So that's what we've been doing a lot of. Our Washougal program was a bit unique. It was a kit program, but a homeowner incentive program, so people were did the work, and then we reimbursed them to put simply uh, we were reimbursed them for the work to do the restoration work on their property. And we've had, I mean, we had a huge success with that one. That one went really well. We had around 33 homes, I think, in the end that went through that program. And Little Washougal was another one that was similar to, uh, it, was a private, it was a private property, but we were able to get in and do, it was right around 10 acres of restoration on the properties of the, there's like two, three properties on Little Washington River, which is pretty exciting to see such a change, especially the Little Washington River. It was fun to see all the fish in that area too. It's a very, a very hopping area. Um, so those are kind of those are those are what we've been doing and what we're trying to do a lot more. But we oh, we also have to do fire property restoration within the city of Vancouver, where it is we have a contract with the city of Vancouver and we go around to properties on Burbridge Creek and help to restore the property right on the creek. Because again, you have these creeks where you have gaps and you have properties, you have private property, then you have the public, and then like Lagunas, you've got DNR, you've got uh, Clark County, you've got the cities, you've got all these and private properties. So really trying to fill in those gaps by also working with private property. And another piece that we started working on, it's been a goal of mine for a while, we're finally really implementing that, and that's to create an organization that is bilingual, bicultural in Spanish. So it goes a little bit above just the Google Translate, I say, or hiring a translator. We have a contractor who's a native speaker in Spanish, and she goes through all of our materials. They're done in both languages now, all of our social media posts, everything like that we've done. This, Image here is actually we did an event where we worked with Spanish speakers. We did Spanish speaking only tree plantings. So we're working on really trying to incorporate and um, make that commitment towards becoming a bilingual organization. So if you haven't heard of the terms, the kind of the more you know, government type terms, transformation, but again, it's, it's looking at the actual meaning of the words and not just translating word for word. And then how you can help. You all know, but it really, it's getting involved. The commitments are great. We have a lot of volunteer events that we do. But in this group, we're always looking for partnerships. I know that we've worked with every, every group that's here, we've worked with, and trying to come up with more ideas for partnerships. We all know what needs to get done, and we all have the passion for it. We want to do it. It's just a matter of getting those funding and those resources together. So the more that we can partner, I love having coffee. Um, I don't drink coffee, I love tea, but if you guys, if anybody here is interested in just getting together and learning more about what we do and maybe just brainstorming, a lot of times I find that if we just know what we all do, then maybe sometime in passing we're going to hear something that says, oh, Sunrise said this, you know, maybe we can get together and do that type of project together. So it really is going to take a lot of those conversations, and I think that's, that's been pretty to the choir. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have information over there to sign up for our newsletter. If you're not already getting that information, I do highly encourage signing up so you can know what it is that we're doing. And I don't think I can show one of them, but here's our events that we have coming up. We are doing quite a bit of work in Richfield this year as well, and a commute, I guess, not Canvas. Um, our goal is to be able to do a lot more in Canvas, so we're hoping. Steve and I are working, we're trying to figure out places that we can plant and do restoration work. So as soon as we get more of those, we'll be doing more plantings in this area. We will have um, our Everett and Ledbetter sites. We'll be doing volunteer events here in a little bit around that one, but we're getting it all back right now. So stay tuned for that. And then we're hoping to be able to start doing, I have to see this. Um, we're hoping to start doing some beach plants next season as well and looking at doing, doing additional other things. And I can't show you this, so, right, because there's no way to do the volume. I mean, I guess you can play it, it's just not as fun without the music, but are you able to? Okay, right? Yeah, I mean, it's just, 
can't sing. But this was at the um, 22, our live display event. But we'll say this will be a plug. Go to our YouTube channel, go to our social media, you can see this place is all the time. I cannot sing. You can sing. Roger can sing. <laughs> I'm not giving you the mic, though, Roger. No one will get it back. It's, it shows, I guess I can narrate it. It does also show that the movie I do can actually be fun. It doesn't seem like it, but it can be fun. And the kids really enjoy it amazingly. Some of the kids in the video you saw, they took the litter cleaner off the paper wrappers and were using that to pull the ivy off of the trees. So, but anyways, that's what I've got. So thank you all for coming. You can come up here. Questions for some time? Just a quick one. Oh, I'm going to start to do a listing of what the natural species are on your site that you plant. That is a really good question. So, everyone probably heard that for the. Okay. Do we have a list on our website of what species we plant on our website? We do not have it on our website. Um, <laughs> we, we, yeah, we don't actually have a list of them. We have them at our events when we do tree plantings. We have shows of what we do plants and we highlighted them but no i thought this like the perfect education as as um yeah no. i think our a lot of our hoas and maybe even in the city street urban tree plants <laughs> they do a little more natural species in yeah that would be a great thing yeah we do have yeah we do have resources but we don't have it we don't have it on there there's a lot of them that we do use but i will think that, yeah we can look at that definitely yeah. Any other questions for the Watershed Alliance? Oh, you're yes, Steve. Steve. Oh. oh no. I'm actually going to ask the same question that Devin asked of the uh, Watershed Council on that. Is where do you see the Watershed Alliance moving in the future? Am I broadcasting? I want to say something. Can you I'm picking on here. So, well, in my here's our magic area i want to be doing a lot more restoration in campus i want to be doing our goal is to really try to do more restoration and more volunteer plantings i we're expanding that work within the whole county but campus is our area that we really have to grow and that we feel like we have a lot more we can be doing and then i know it's someone here Katie's here but we are also looking at hoas so there is if you are thank you because i was going to put a plug for this that if you are in an HOA and you're at all interested in maybe trying to see how things can be planted a little bit more environmentally friendly or actions, anything along those lines that are impacting water quality, please shoot me a message because I'm working on some stuff. It's too much to go into, but I've got I've got some plans that I'm working on and I could really use engaged citizens that are in HOAs that are passionate about this type of work to maybe be kind of part of our pilot with that. So so looking at trying to do um, HOA education and more plantings and yeah, just keep keep coming in. But hopefully they take that 20,000 and putting it into, let's just go big, 40,000. Let's keep these plants going. Any other questions? Anything online? All right, round of applause for Black Alliance. Thank you. Fantastic. Up next, we have our conservation district to come and talk about water quality improvements through voluntary conservation. In the meantime, who has a commitment? You can shout it out. Let's hear it, Maddie. You're going to, oh, I. <laughs> Um, so we just heard you can do things on your property to manage stormwater. Thank you for being committed to that, Maddie. Um, yeah. Carolyn, take it away. Cool. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Carolyn Rice. I work with Clark Conservation District. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. I'll put this on here. 
Um, okay, great. So yes, we're talking about water quality improvements through voluntary conservation. Um, we also have other staff from the district here today. So we have Zora Oppenheimer, our executive director, back there, and then Mary Kinney, who's our new communications and outreach lead, also in the back. Um, so feel free to talk to any of, any of us if you have any questions. Um, so today, what I'm going to talk about is I'll give an overview of the district and what we do, who we are, uh, and then I will talk about one of our major programs right now, which is Smart Clark. You all have some little gifts on your tables. Really <laughs> smart, it's kind of a little stress ball. Um, and I'll talk about what we're doing specifically in the Lackamas watershed for Poop Smart Park and then some future goals and opportunities. All right. So, what is a conservation district? Conservation districts are special purpose districts, kind of like a fire district or a school district. We are non regulatory and voluntary parts of the state government. We're locally led, and our mission is to support soil and water health. All of our services are free, and we support soil and water health through offering expertise and funding opportunities for local residents. Um, we really are meant to understand local needs um, and be a government agency that can do that and help locals connect with other government entities. Um, we are grant funded. Uh, and Clark Conservation District itself was established in 1942. So conservation, conservation districts came out of the Dust Bowl. So a lot of them have been around for a really long time. So that's briefly about us. And then we work with quite a range of people from residential landowners and land managers across lots of different land use types. So urban, rural, suburban. Um, farmers and livestock owners, small forest landowners, or broadly just anyone who lives in Clark County, um, and, and more. And we prioritize working with people who live along streams because of the um, conservation impacts that you can have uh, on those properties. So what do we do? Conservation districts are kind of structured in that we have subject matter experts who in a variety of different fields who can go to individual people's properties and help give custom advice on how to do conservation where they live and connect to funding opportunities as available. So our different programs include the Habitat Conservation and Restoration Program, and this covers fish, uh, wildlife, and pollinator habitat. We do like stream restoration. We have a native plant sale every February. Um, and quite a variety of other work. And then we have a producer and working lands program. And this is focused on conservation work on working lands that includes uh, farmland, um, like pasture, and forest land. And we'll talk a lot more about that program as it relates to livestock later on in the context of the Spark Clark. So, and I also just want to call out in that program, we've talked a bit about soil health um, and farmland and, you know, nutrient use. Um, we just, we have a new cover pro program that's designed to, you know, help support soil health on farmland. So, um, anyway, just putting a plug in for that. Um, and then we have a more cost-cutting program. That's our water quality and quantity program, very related to the previous two programs um, and to Food Smart Clark. And finally, we have a, an outreach and education program where we do workshops and create educational materials and, you know, just spread the word about what we're doing and also give people resources to implement conservation where they live. And so one of our biggest programs right now is called Poop Smart Clark. It's an effort to improve fecal bacteria pollution through voluntary conservation. So we're getting right to the point, um, there's pollution from poop, and we can be smarter about managing poop. Um, we got, um, the program is inspired by the Skagit County's Poop Smart program, so they donated a lot of the graphics and materials to us. Poop Smart Clark 
was established in 2021. It is a partnership program led by Clark Conservation District. Uh, we're working with Clark County Public Health Department and Clark County Clean Water Division, as well as WSU Extension for Clark County. And we have funding from the Natural Resource Conservation Service, the Lower Columbia Fish Recovery Board, the Washington State Conservation Commission, and the Washington Department of Ecology. Um, and again, to the question of poop, um, E. coli, it's a, it's a dangerous pollutant, right? And we see beach warnings and closures for it um, across the county in you know, Battleground, Vancouver, Lackness Lakes. Um, and particularly as the Department of Ecology folks noted, uh, fecal bacteria pollution is quite an issue in the Lackness watershed. Um, and Poop Smart Park is about addressing these sources of the bacterial pollution, which are generally not like one major, you know, you know, property that's contributing to the problem, but rather it's contributing across entire watersheds from, you know, it's a lot of small things that add up. And so we're addressing that through, again, voluntary conservation action. So this is a map um, showing fecal bacteria pollution across the county. So you have the county outlined in orange, but then all of the color coding on the inside is the severity of fecal bacteria pollution in the county. As you can see, there's a lot, there's a lot. Um, and so it's definitely a widespread issue. And then this down here, this is the lacrimous watershed, as we saw earlier. Um, and so where is all of this fecal bacteria coming from, right? It's not that there's just like poop floating in the streams. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some of the different sources that we're addressing through Poop Smart Park. So we are focused on a few different sources as priorities right now. Um, On-site septic system, livestock, and jaws. So um, I will, in the rest of this presentation, I will go through each of these sources, how the pollution happens, and what we're doing to address it. Overall, our work um, encompasses outreach and education, water testing, data analysis, and funding incentive opportunities for septic maintenance and livestock management. Um, we're just trying to like meet water quality needs, you know, address the pollution in ways that also meet people's needs for you know ease of livestock management or you know making it easier on your budget to um, maintain your septic system. So septic systems. I'm going to talk briefly about how they work, how this pollution happens. Um, so septic systems are wastewater treatment systems, right, for residences that are not connected to city sewer. And in Clark County, we have over 30,000 septic systems. So that's a lot of septic systems. And in the Lackness Creek watershed, there's over 4,000. This is a diagram of how they work. So you can see that there's a well over here that is notably uphill from the septic system. Um, the septic system takes the wastewater from the residents and treats it in multiple stages and then lets it percolate down back into the groundwater. And there's a lot of different types of septic systems. And, you know, this is just an example diagram. But I think what is hopefully clear from this is that if you have an issue in the system, that could be really bad for water quality. And unfortunately, there is evidence that this is happening in the county, that there are septic systems with issues. Um, we mentioned briefly earlier DNA-specific testing. It's called MST testing. Um, it's expensive, so it hasn't been done everywhere. But in places where it has been done, including up in the East Fork Lewis River watershed, which is one of our focus areas for Poop Smart Park, the county did some MST testing and found um, human-specific DNA markers, as well as evidence of optical brightener, which is like from detergents. So again, from wastewater, you know, your septic system takes your laundry detergent, you know, anything that goes down the drain. So that is a really helpful piece of information that's saying that um, we are seeing issues with septic systems. Um, and that MST testing was super helpful in the East Fork Lewis River area for helping us target our outreach. 
So to avoid issues with septic systems, regular maintenance is really helpful. And the county mandates inspections every one to three years, depending on the type of septic system. Um, unfortunately, about a third of septic systems in Clark County are past due for their regular inspections. Um, and this is data from June of this year. And so this is for the whole county. In the Lackamas Watershed specifically, it's very similar ratio. It's about 30% are past due. And that's over a thousand systems in the Lackamas Watershed. Inspectors are really important because they can catch issues that would otherwise lead to massive failures, but can be fixed with you know, smaller repairs before that. Um, and they can also identify systems that are potentially just leaking completely raw waste into the groundwater um, that you can't tell from above ground. Sometimes failures are just really not obvious at all. Um, a visual example of the lack of inspection compliance is here on the left. So this is the whole county. And all of these red dots are tax lots with past due septic systems. So it's quite an issue over the whole county. Um, even you can see there's little dots in urban areas, but um, yeah, it's, it's all over. So again, inspections are really important and they're not happening at the level that they need to. So there must be some barriers for people, right? even if they're getting letters from the county um, every, you know, when they're due, um, it's not happening all the time. So one of those barriers is cost. Inspections can cost about $150. Um, and, you know, that can be cost prohibitive for some people. And, you know, it's not really realistic for Clark County Public Health to pursue enforcement and fine 11,000 properties in the county. Um, plus, it's not something that everybody knows that they need to do or why it's important. Um, so Hoop Smart Clark is trying to encourage voluntary increases in septic inspection compliance. Um, and so we have a septic reimbursement program. So this program uh, is available to the East Fork Lewis River and Lackamas watersheds, not available to the whole county yet. Um, we applied for an ecology grant for um, financial year 25 to expand the program. Um, but this covers inspections, pumping, and repairs for people with septic systems to incentivize voluntary compliance. Um, and we also do education about septic systems and the requirements and preventive care and how it's important. So, so far, Here's some information on how it's going. Um, we rolled it out in the East Fork Lewis River um, in June of last year. Um, so this is data for the program overall, Lackamas and the East Fork Lewis River. We processed 161 reimbursements for over $70,000. Um, and about half of all of the systems that we've done reimbursements for were half to for their inspections. So um, that's really exciting because that means that we are helping to, you know, reduce these cost barriers for people. Um, anecdotally, I can just say from, so I'm the one who's managing this program and talking to people every day about it. Um, people are just really grateful for these funds. Um, a lot of people tell me how they're on, you know, fixed incomes and they have to pick and choose their expenses. So. Um, this program is really helping people out financially. Um, yeah, so in the East Fork Lewis River, oh, I have more information to show you. Um, this is the Lackness Watershed specifically. So we rolled this out in August of last year. Um, so it's been about a year and we processed over 100 inspections and um, also about 50 um, maintenance activities. So this is also showing that, you know, we're helping people become compliant with the county requirements and also, you know, helping people fix issues that they may have and need to correct with their systems. In the East Fork Lewis River, not in the Lackamas Watershed, we do have funding as well for people who need like entire septic system replacements, which can cost upwards or, you know, a whole replacement can cost between $20,000 and $60,000. 
And so we're helping cover those as well as major repairs. Um, and some of those projects that we've done have kind of been found through the reimbursement program. Oh, on average, inspections are about $150 in pumping and repairs paying costs. Quite a range, under $2,000 or more. For really big projects, like we're funding in the East Fork Lewis River, um, this is a tank replacement that we funded earlier, back in like February of this year, that cost about $10,000. Um, we offer these as grants, not loans to people. Um, and it's kind of filling a hole in the current system where, you know, there's some, uh, some different loan programs, but not a lot of grant programs for people um, for septic work. And then this is a full system replacement that we collaboratively funded with the CRAFT 3 loan program. So we funded $20,000 of a full system replacement. Um, so again, we're grant funded, and this is a grant funded program, so we'd love to offer this program in Lacrimis as well, but we just have limited funds currently. Um, and we prioritize the projects based on water quality impacts and financial need. And we've also, as part of our application to Ecology, um, applied to offer this to the entire county as well. But you know, we can't, you know, the grant is for $500,000, and that will be very helpful, but across all of the activities within that grant, you know, there's still a lot more that we would love to be able to do. So we did work on a proposal to seek funding through a direct legislative appropriation to adequately scale up the program. Um, so if you're interested, happy to talk more about that. Okay. I'm going to take a sip of water and we're going to switch gears to talk about livestock. Okay, so how does pollution from livestock happen and what are we doing about it? Probably the most obvious thing would be, you know, horses or cows pooping in a stream, right? That is obvious um, as a way that that can happen, but there's also other ways. Um, so through Smart Park, um, some of the main um, things we're addressing are runoff from manure, um, particularly manure that's, you know, on properties that are, where there's just a lot of an animals concentrated in a small area and the land just like, can't handle that amount of manure and pressure from all the animals. Um, so the, the animals may not have direct access to the stream, but if there's a lot of manure, a lot of mud, that can all, you know, with the rain, wash down and into the streams. Um, because the rain will pick up the bacteria and the nutrients from, um, from the manure. So Clark County has the highest farm density in the state and the third highest number of farms in the state. And so we have a lot of small acreage properties where people have you know, a few cows, a few horses, a few sheep, alpacas, llamas, et cetera. Um, and combined over a whole watershed of a whole county, this can make a really big impact. So, um, that also means that behavior change can make a big impact. And Clark CD is a really great agency to lead this effort because we are a voluntary, confidential agency with a lot of experience working around livestock management. So we've historically served farmers and we have a really strong background in agriculture. And our role is really to be trusted source of expert advice and funding to landowners. Um, it's all free. And, you know, we're never going to, you know, tell on anybody or find anybody for what they're doing on their property so we can really build that trust. So, examples of what we do with um, landowners, um, here are some. So, uh, a very low tech solution is covering the manure pile with a tarp. Keeps the rain off, it helps the manure compost faster. Um, so, you know, we really tailor solutions to landowners' needs and what's realistic for them. We have certified farm planners who are experts in all of this. Um, so projects can be as simple as this or as intensive as a full, you know, three-day composting manure storage facility. This can cost, you know, fifty dollars to $150,000. Um, 
And this is something that the Natural Resource Conservation Service is helping us um, fund these projects. Um, and so that's really, really great because we can help people who wouldn't otherwise, you know, just would not be realistic to afford something like this, but it makes a really big difference for their, you know, ease of management and for the livestock health and for the water quality. Um, another example of something we do is um, heavy use areas. So over here you see there's like some gravel footing down um, that can help reduce mud so that you know livestock, if they're concentrated in their use over here, they're not just like pounding up the pasture, they're walking on this reinforced footing. Um, we also do things like fencing to keep livestock out of streams and also to do rotational grazing so that animals don't graze down pastures to just bare ground and therefore mud. Um, yeah, and so these services are available to all of Clark County. They're not geographically limited. Um, we do prioritize funding projects kind of based on water quality and some geographic um, elements. So to connect people with our livestock services, one thing we did in the last this watershed specifically, um, just this summer was door to door outreach and it was really successful. So we sent this postcard notifying people that we would be coming by. We also, we do do translation of our materials um, into Spanish and Russian. Um, and we reached 167 properties this summer and we'll be doing this um, again next summer. Um, we spoke with seven, about 70 households and of those we got um, we got 11 immediate signups for our livestock services, so for one of our certified planners to come out to their um, to their property. And we chose these properties based on um, water quality priorities, you know, proximity proximity to a stream, that kind of thing. Um, and I just heard from our working lands program manager actually that you know we finished this effort in September, and we already have. Um, two of these people signed up to pursue funding through us, so that's just really exciting. Um, and we'll be doing more of this next summer. Uh, this, the funding for this work comes from the Lower Columbia Fish Recovery Board, so, and it's focused on the lack of this watershed. Let's see. Um, we also do lots of other kinds of outreach that I can talk about more later, but for now I'm just going to transition into the last priority source that we um, are addressing, which is dogs. Um, so there are over 101,000 dogs in Clark County, um, and they produce over 18 tons of poop every day. So that is a lot of poop. I have a dog, they're great, and there's also, you know, there's a lot of poop. Um, and again, that DNA-specific testing we did in the East Fork Lewis River watershed um, with our friends at um, Clark County, uh, found dog poop DNA at every site that was tested. So it's, yeah, when it's left out, um, it can really easily run into the waterway. Um, and dog poop carry, carries a lot of pathogens and bacteria. Um, so it's really something we want to support people to minimize. Um, some of the solutions that we are you know, pursuing um, are mainly around education and norm setting. So educating people to always bag it and trash it, even on their own properties. Um, and then we really promote the county program, Cannons for Clean Water. Um, if you're curious about that, I want to chat with Eric about it. Um, it's a really great program. And so we share their resources a lot. Um, so they have stuff like this that you can share on social media. They also have lots of resources for talking with your neighbors or your homeowners association um, about setting norms and expectations around picking up after your dogs. And they have a pledge. So it's a really great program. Um, we also, we give out, you know, dog bag dispensers um, when we're at community events. So we don't have funding programs for this, but we are, you know, trying to encourage behavior change. Um, this is an example of um, our setup at the Canvas Farmers Market. We were there this past summer and we'll be doing more community events um, in the Lackamas watershed over the next few years. And we, you know, we talk about all of our different activities when we're out at events like this. 
Okay, so next up some opportunities. Um, we're going to be, again, doing continued outreach and education in the Lacamas and East Fork Lewis River watersheds with the grants that we currently have to, you know, the Department of Ecology and um, the Recovery Board. Uh, we'll be also doing more septic and livestock projects. And then finally, because we've seen so much, so much success, we're really looking to expand the program. Um, and so we applied for an ecology grant to offer the septic reimbursement program to the whole county and do that DNA specific water testing in the Lacamas watershed. So we can figure out, you know, is it septic systems and or livestock and or dogs, et cetera. Um, and we're looking, you know, at a variety of different funding sources for, for this expansion. All right, that's all I have. Thank you all so much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Excellent job, Carolyn. And I did a plug real quick. When I started at the Department of Health in 2018, our conservation district had one staff person and no money. <laughs> How many do you have now? Ten. Ten staff and some money. Not enough yet. But you guys really did a great job. Um, we do have some questions online, but I encourage anyone else questions to come in line. I'll ask these questions if there's not mine. Um, Carolyn, can you give examples of the cost for inspections and minor repairs versus the cost of some typical major repairs that result from not making repairs? So, yeah. deferred maintenance versus proactive maintenance. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, um, inspections cost about an average of $150. And then, one of the most common maintenance costs is pumping, which usually needs to be done every three to five years. And that, depending on the tank size, I've seen it cost, you know, $300 to $900. Really varies a lot. Um, and then if you're replacing other, like, smaller internal components, you know, materials cost for that can, again, range a lot and labor for those two. But our, our maximum reimbursement, we, like, pool um, pumping and um, minor repairs funds for a maximum of $1,000, and that usually helps people cover those costs. Our average reimbursement so far has been about $450 um, across those, you know, 160-ish reimbursements. Um, so those costs versus, you know, major repairs or replacements. Um, the major repairs that we've been looking at through our program so far have cost between like $1,500 and $10,000. And then that, you know, that replacement that we helped fund was about $35,000. Um, and we fund a maximum of $20,000 for our grants. Um, and yeah, full system replacements again can cost between twenty to $60,000. And I guess something I would add on there is that a lot of the septic systems in Clark County are sort of towards the end of their useful life. Systems last, you know, 20 to 30 to 40 years. There's quite a range as well, but um, a lot of the systems in the county are older. So there's definitely like, risk of a lot more costs um, for replacing systems and connecting to super where we can. Thank you. And then another question, I'm not sure if I'm going to get this right. Uh, are there any vendors you know of that will allow aesthetic reimbursement to instead be a pay for service? Oh, I think I know what they're talking about. Okay. So, yeah, so something that we've started working with, um, contractors on so there's like certified septic contractors um they get certified through the county to do this work um and some of them will accept direct payments from us so that um you know someone can't float the cost of a thousand dollar a thousand dollars for something for instance you know we can just like send that to the contractor directly if the contractor is okay with it but um i do not have a list off the top of my head but if the person who asked that question um, you can email me um, and ask me more specifically. Thank you. Any other questions for Karen? Thank you. I'm being edited weeks ago. Now, I forgot to ask you when you do door to door services, mm -hmm. are you targeting like if you see overgrazed properties or large animals? in the screens and they're looking at properties that you say, oh boy, they are not following this 
devices. How do you do the door to door? Yeah, so, um, and Zora, Zora, do you want to kind of talk about the confidentiality piece maybe around livestock as well? Like, we, we do do some like prioritization of properties, but we are very protective of the livestock specific information. Um, so I, I guess I will say like we do some prioritization, but I won't maybe say more other than that. But but yeah, we um Zora, do you wanna add anything? I would just add to, I don't know, we have Department of Apologies non full source inspector in the room. So there is a relationship where, you know, landowners who have issues identified by Department of Apology or by the county may be referred to the conservation district for help and assistance to help them correct any issues to not have enforcement actions taken. So those might be areas that are targeted or prioritized because the county or ecology has identified them and then referred the landowners to them. Is that fair? I think so. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, well, I can repeat the question for, for the post online. So, um, Zora is shaking her head. No, we do not. Oh, the question was, do we have caps for funding for things like um, livestock practices and riparian work? Um, no, we do not. Um, and we try to cover, we can cover up to 100% of costs for some of the livestock work. Um, yeah, we really try to make it financially feasible for people. Have you had many projects that in the past years? For fencing specifically, um, I do not know the numbers for fencing, but we do have, um, yeah, several, and maybe Zora knows more of the numbers off the top of her head, but um, we do have several livestock projects, like cost share projects in the works at different stages. So we have some completed newer storage facilities, like I showed, um, and then, um, you know, others are just starting, others are kind of midway in the process. Um, so, yeah, not sure about total numbers, though. And it's grant funding, right? Yes. Only if the grants keep coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everybody, and thank you to Park Conservation District. Well, thanks, everybody. So we are slightly ahead of the schedule of that practice. I do know there are some other issues that work on our own agenda, so I want to just open it up if. Sorry to put you on the spot, uh, Lower Columbia Esbury Partnership or Rainey from City of Vancouver, if you'd like to come, or any others. Do I have any other organizations in the room that might want to just briefly give a two minute overview of what you do and what you could do in the uh, lack of watershed? Oh, Rainey and then Chris. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else want their two minutes? Oh, and then Kaylee. So yeah, you guys can just line up. Maybe Steve West, can we get you up here? You here? Yep. All right. There you go. Thanks. <clears throat> well, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Rainey, and I work for the City of Vancouver at the Water Resources Education Center. Uh, this is my eleventh year working with a countywide educational program called the Student Watershed Monitoring Network. Uh, the program itself has been around since 27th year, and what we do is we go to schools and we um, have a bunch of curriculum that is aligned with state, Washington State educational standards, so NGSS standards, to really engage kids in science at all grade levels and to get them outside and connected to their monitoring locations where we end up doing a battery of water quality tests with them throughout the school year um, with the goal that by the end of the year they have an idea of what has been happening at their site and 
maybe the different things that could be impacting their site. So we talk a lot, a lot about stormwater runoff um, and salmon habitat as well, as long as as well as upstream communities. Um, I think that's kind of all I can think of right now. Uh, hi, I'm Haley McLaughlin Burton, and I'm the communications manager for Clark County Public Works, which includes clean water. So I just wanted to make a few quick plugs. One, um, Eric Lambert, do you want to raise your hand standing back the there? Eric is our clean water education and outreach specialist, but looks like he's going to come here and talk about what he does. Um, here, why don't you just take your mic? Okay, thank you. Yes, Eric Lambert, uh, Clark County clean water outreach specialist. I also help lead stormwater partners in Southwest Washington, which is a collaboration of Clark County and the cities that have uh, NPDES permits and we collaborate on education and outreach requirements. We're actually having a symposium on November 16th. So um, if you're interested in that, you can take one of my cards back there. There's also a bookmark for stormwaterpartners.com where you can find a bunch of our work and our resources there. Um, I'll give another plug for another organization on my steering committee for called the Clean Rivers Coalition, which started as the entire state of Oregon, um, but also a couple of years back, they reached out and said, hey, Southwest Washington, you know, in a lot of ways, you're a little bit more like us sharing the Columbia River, sharing a, a media shed than you are with, with the other folks in Western Washington, which are primarily good for the South. So we've got a number of, of Initiatives, one of them is a follow the water campaign, which if you're familiar with Puget Sound, they have a Puget Sound Starts Here campaign, which is really about connecting people to place-based areas. And so follow the water really takes a three-step approach, connect people to their water, which is a very important part of engaging stewardship and making people feel vested in protecting their water. The second part is connecting people's behavior to their water. And then the last part is providing behavior change resources so that people can make positive watershed choices. And so Follow the Water is an umbrella, and we have another campaign underneath that called What's Your Lawn Style, which is really targeted at uh, helping folks move away from things like weed and feed, obviously very important for the conversation we're having today. And so those resources are back there in addition to our KNS Clean Water resources. And as I mentioned earlier, the Explore Your Watershed Story Map, which I encourage you to take the card for. Unfortunately, the GIS is down right now. But it'll be back soon. I have confidence. Um, so that's pretty much what I do. And I encourage you to take my card and uh, look forward to reaching out and uh, connecting with all of you later. So I have the good fortune of having Eric on my team. Um, so clean water, you can't help me that. Uh, so the other plug I wanted to make was uh, also my programs I manage our community engagement and inclusion team, and that includes our volunteer program, and we have some restoration plantings coming up, including um, at Round Lake uh, in early November, um, and that's on a Friday, it is our event that's open to the public, so if you're interested um, in learning more, go to our website and come get my card. Um, our volunteer program coordinator isn't here today, um, but I'm happy to help connect you to her. Um, a lot of folks may not know that the part of the park over there on the other side of the roundabout is uh, managed by our Park and Lands Division, um, the Society of City of Canada. So um, we kind of work together and also make sure um, kind of one of our bigger campaigns in this watershed uh, from the public works side of things is every year, um, kind of educating people on not trampling sensitive habitats, um, particularly in the lily fields. So um, if you want to talk about helping us amplify that message, please come and talk to me. Um, and then finally, I have a really weird ask. Uh, so NASA sent a bunch of seeds to the moon a few years ago. And now organizations can apply to get a moon tree and plant it in a public space. And they provide curriculum to teach the community and school kids about science, including protecting water and earth's resources. And I think it's really cool. And I have lots of land. I just need someone to partner with us on the education piece. So 
Um, please help me get a new tree in Clark County. It's going to be really cool. All right. Hey, I'm Chris Hathaway. I'm with the Lower Columbia Estuary Partnership and I'm the Community Programs Director there. Um, our Executive Director, Elaine Placido, is also here today. Um, we are a, uh, about a 28 year old bi state nonprofit national estuary program that covers geography from Bonneville Dam to the Pacific Ocean. Um, amazingly, we do a ton of work in Clark County. Um, and we do lots of different kinds of work. We have a staff of about 30 people. Um, it ranges from like large scale habitat restoration projects, such as the recently completed Steigerwald Lake National Wildlife Refuge Project. Um, we have a large, a large project that's getting started on the East Fork Lewis River, um, the Ridgefield Pits Project, um, work uh, happening in Washougal on Camping Creek, um, we do ecosystem monitoring and have a large team that does that up and down the Columbia River. And then we have a large community programs team that does all sorts of different stuff, including environmental education for kids, uh, riparian planting project, mostly in Clark County. Um, uh, we have a couple of big canoes um, that hold 14,000 brazils that we get folks watering during the summer. And then we also have um, a growing stormwater program that's focused on stormwater retrofits. Um, uh, we have a big project in Washougal with uh, Washougal High School in the city of Washougal to look at that high school parking lot. We probably can get a lot and other projects definitely coming online. Um, we've been doing the event without all the partners in the room, um, particularly folks here like the Department of Ecology, a um, ton of work with Clark County, the city of Vancouver is an important partner, Port of Vancouver, Port of Columbia Fish Recovery Board, um, so, um, obviously, as everybody's mentioned, um, and this is especially true, I think, for nonprofits, um, you know, we really need the partnership of funders and landowners and schools and so forth to be able to do um, the kind of work that we do. So that's it for me. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Steve West with Lower Columbia Fish Recovery Board. I saw Darren and uh, Devin look at me and I thought about that team, but then I remembered uh, Councillor Medvigy, who is on our board, uh, is here, so I figured I couldn't do that. Um, we also have a TAC member, uh, Nate. Um, so we, um, we wear three hats, essentially. Um, one is watershed planning, which is um, essentially alley working on a plan for allocating water throughout Southwest Washington. Um, we also are a lead entity, uh, which is, that's where we wear our lead entity hat and um, operate our grant rounds. Um, this year, it's gonna be interesting. Um, RCO is probably gonna allocate about $5 million in regular funds. And then we, there's another um, pot of money that's about $4.8 million is gonna focus on riparian. Um, Please don't ask me about that because we don't know the site works on that, but we know it's going to be right around 4.8 million um, with another potential for $5 million. So we stand to have a pretty robust grant round this year. Um, we also have a grant round up in the upper Cowlitz, um, which is not really for me, this group, um, but we do have that. And then we've been authorized by our board to take on another grant round that still needs to be signed off by the judge at this point. Um, so we do have that as another um, grant opportunity. Um, and then we're also a regional recovery organization, and that's where we hold our recovery plan, uh, which is it's not our recovery plan, it's National Marine Fisheries Service. So um, that's who we are and what we do. We operate pretty much exclusively in uh, Southwest Washington. Fantastic. And I also wanted to acknowledge we have um, guests from Fran Friends of Vancouver Lake here today, and I'm putting you on the spot as well. But I was wondering if I could invite somebody up from Friends of Vancouver Lake if they would like to just say some words, Ted. And Ted's also one of our Clean Water Commissioners, so very thankful to have Ted here today. Ted Gacy, I want to give a shout out too to my uh, board of directors for 
the watershed lies in Southwest Washington. I've been a board member for over eight years. This is my last year, unfortunately, but it's a great organization as well. <clears throat> Friends of Vancouver Lake was formed about five years ago, initially because there was a Eurasian mill foil invasion in the lake that we thought was simply going to turn Vancouver Lake into more or less a swamp. We couldn't get local, <clears throat> state, or any agency to step in and, and do the work, so we lobbied uh, the Department of Ecology and they agreed that we could, as a private entity, get a, a permit to treat a public, water, public body of water, which we did and successfully. And then we realized our goal is much broader than just getting rid of one invasive weed. Our, our, our mission is to get the water quality in Vancouver Lake improved enough so that we can have year-round recreation. And so the huge events like uh, the Masters Rowing Championship won't get canceled at the 11th hour, and costing the community hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars over these years of cancellations because of cyanobacteria and other problems. So our goal right now is we're going to look for projects at the state and federal level that will make Vancouver Lake habitable for fish, wildlife, and for recreation here and on into the future. That's our, that's our goal. Thanks for your Thank you, Ted, and maybe next year there'll be a Vancouver Lake Symposium. Just throwing it out there. Oh, what did I just say? I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I'm very excited to have everyone here today. And with that, let's take a short break, um, approximately, let's do 10 minutes, and then we will come back with just more open Q&A. I would ask any of the speakers, we're going to have a panel like uh, Q&A session up here. But take 10, um, and thank you for sticking around.
Because you're like, All right, everybody. If I could get our panelists, uh, our speakers to come back up, and who knows, maybe we'll actually get out early. All good meetings and on time, right? So, Clark County, Mr. Bob Hutton, or Jeff Schnabel. I have a question. Yeah. Can I get my friends from Apology, Black Miss Watershed Council, Canis, Watershed Alliance, Clark Conservation District, and Clark County in front. All right, panelists. I hate to end great conversation. I think I'm losing people. Maybe the break is a bad idea. We can keep it short and sweet, and everyone can hit the streets. I just also wanted to mention thank you to Kaylee and Haley for organizing. Um, we were able, all of our leftover lunches, we were able to coordinate with Salvation Army to donate those. So thank you to Kaylee and Haley for making sure our lunches went somewhere. And they wouldn't be wasted. 
All right, I'd like to invite up all of our speakers to come join this panel. Did we lose Bob Hutton? Bob, Jeff, Sunrise, Carolyn, we have Aileen still, Nate's still here, Lackamas Watershed Council. Okay. So this is, we're going to try to keep this, we'll keep this going for long since we have questions. Um, to an extent. <laughs> Um, all right, how about we start with an easy one and pass it down the line? We have to have a show of things. Stinky water. What are the water conditions? Let's see. I actually, this is so much easier. Let me just check this one too. But um, I think the first one would be. Uh, both from the agency and the first one is that uh, we will definitely want to support the ecology and their um, development the advanced resolution. Uh, so that's the second Oh, look, you get to pass this with them. All right. Um, I suppose from an agency stand, standpoint, um, we're very committed to providing as much support as we can to um, local communities and um, on my end of things to uh, provide uh, high quality data and high quality uh, context to that data um, and communicate it as uh, clearly as we can to everyone here. Man, I'm putting this on the spot. So I think that the online people may not know, so I'm Sunrise from the Watershed Alliance in Southwest Washington. I already said what our goals are, I guess our commitments are just to continue to get out there and get the word out there around water quality and trying to get more and more people being able to be outdoors and planting trees with us on a personal level of a commitment. Um, boy, I'm focusing a lot more on working around environmental justice and on a community level. So I'm involved in different organizations that are doing work along those lines. So. I'm just going to continue to be on the on the council for LULAC and different groups that I'm part of. I am a water resources engineer, so I've dedicated my career to uh, clean water. But my um, one of my major commitments is to continue to take um, data that uh, you know the average person who has not dedicated their career to water resources. Um, to take that data and make it more understandable and distill it so that the community can understand better understand their impact on their own watersheds. So for Clark Conservation District, um, I would say we are just going to continue our work of um, helping people in the county implement a variety of different things that help benefit water quality. Um, and to securing more funding um, to continue doing that work. Um, and personally, uh, I just, I got a new dog and um, very committed to picking up after him. <laughs> I want to say I expise into the 23 too late game, but I missed this year. So I just really want us to be involved with the different volunteer programs around the county and not with next year's. Uh, so from an agency perspective, I would say trying to leverage the past knowledge and experience that we gained over the last multiple decades in this watershed and to maximize the potential benefit of that information. And on a personal note, since I live in the watershed, um, it's a beautiful watershed and I'd like to see it maintained for the real gems. And it doesn't take much to just look around and see what's there. So we talked a bunch about some of the monitoring involvement we have with uh, the clean water division. So I will, I will put on the, uh, the stormwater management we have for the um, position funds. Um, and so one of my commitments uh, as we try to manage our stormwater infrastructure going forward, uh, countywide, the safety here in, in the lack of watershed is continue looking for ways to be more efficient about how we do that. 
uh, look for ways to uh, improve our management of our assets long term, uh, to make sure that those things are working to the best of their ability to help with the problem this week. China had a really big problem today because we've had a whole raft of people come together in order to clean up the market and really properly we looking for a solution. And I want to take on a personal level, say, what are you doing to do which is so very, very impossible? And look up, looking down the Columbia River. That's the problems that they, they have, and that the Columbia River needs to be cleaned up all by itself. And we can put the problem to that, and we've got to open the problems and put them all up in that river. And I'm Vicki Wesley with the uh, Lockhamus Watershed Council, and we pegged ourselves as the lifeguards of Lockhamus Lake area. And so my, my hope is that we're going to continue to be those lifeguards. And then my personal level is somehow when I was a kid, I got designated by Mother Nature to be her garbage queen. And I have been picking up garbage since then, and I will continue to pick up garbage. <laughs> I love that. Um, there's a few things you said there. Black and this lifeguards. I, I mean, someone needs to make a shirt that says that. Well, I'm just going to uh, read a couple of these. You are pledged. I will avoid overloading the soil with nutrients, manage manure properly, and let natural vegetation do its thing to prevent erosion. I am committed to staying involved with volunteer cleanup and restoration efforts. I will help clean the shoreline at Vancouver Lake. And I think they forgot to write and laugh in the slate. So um, <laughs> here's a question, and, and anyone can take this one. What do you think is that going to be our biggest challenge or unmet need, um, or biggest need or challenge in the Lackamas watershed and Lackamas Lake going forward? Implementation of some kind of mitigation to resolve the problems as a collaborative effort, because that's what it's going to take. Anyone else want to raise their hand? I'll go to Bob first. I was going to say just uh, from perspective of past experience, long-term commitment. Long-term commitment. Bob is the most committed. 30 years at the county, everybody. I love it. <laughs> there you go. Bob, me too, actually. I was going to also say long-term commitment, uh, but a number of us, I just heard up and down the line, you know, under their breath a little bit was money, right? So funding is going to be key in all of this, and it's going to take all of us to continue pushing uh, our, you know, local and state and federal legislators to continue to push, which I think goes back to the longevity piece too, right? You, a lot of this tends to go with the money. Um, if we have funding, we're all going to continue to work on it, and when there isn't funding, a lot of the agencies are going to look at each other and say, we wish we had the money, but that's where the push is going to be needed from all of us. So. Well, I did hear Steve West say he had a lot of money. Right? <laughs> Sorry, Steve. <laughs> Does anyone else want to ask a question of the panel? Counselor, would you be interested in asking a question? No. Um, Amaya. Amaya, would you also introduce yourself to the group? Hi, everyone. I'm Amaya Smith. I'm with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And one sentence I hear in other groups, and I think would be ever here, is that really investing in our youth is one thing to keep some of this longevity going for these long term solutions. So I'm curious if the, hello, oh, there we go. If the city of Kansas will have any sort of education or collaboration with some of the monitoring efforts um, with some of the the classrooms um, and even knowing that some of the waters outreach to some of their school districts as well get the about the monitoring. All right, who wants to talk about schools? Roger. I'm working with the Austin right now. Uh, they're growing long tubes of um, cyanobacteria and watching 
then migrate up and down the flight. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I'll hand it to Rainy. Rainy will be our big schools coordinator along with Elsa, probably. Oh, right. Yes. So as far as things go, um, for the past six, six or so years, uh, I've worked with most of the fifth graders in the Kansas School District um, with a variety of cases around the lakes and their own stormwater and off campus. Um, and I've been able to also work with the seventh graders and obviously the past few years and um, some environmental science students at East Freedom. And what's kind of fun about that is um, I've been long enough hanging out in the waterways with these children. That they usually remember fifth grade. Um, so when I come back, I'm still talking about what I'm on. So I don't know. I don't remember this. So, yeah, there's a lot of great engagement within the Tuba School District. Um, also, we are trying to work with Vancouver Public Schools, uh, Evergreen Public Schools, Hawkinson, Battleground, just way too large. Um, Sorry, the boys go far away. Uh, so there, there's definitely throughout the time throughout the years, I would say that the almost started years of this monitoring program that we have to be involved in. We served around 75 to 1,000 students throughout the county and throughout the grades. Um, we used to be at our high point right before COVID, about 4,000 students a year across the county, but now that I'm the only one doing it, I can only handle about 2,100 a year. 2100 is a lot. And I. Ooh. Test. I would give uh, Tam at uh, Odyssey as well a really good uh, shout out. I've went and spoken to them as well. And they, I remember they're like, thank you, Miss Rostifer, for climate change. And I was like, no, it's not my fault. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions for the panel? Or Chris? I think, oh, it's back. A round of applause for Haley and Kaylee again. They're keeping it together. Yeah, I, I guess this would be mostly for the county city. Uh, in 1972, I was a five year old and I learned to water ski on this lake. And there weren't a lot of houses around the lake then. It seems like this is a super developing watershed. And we know how important land use is, the water quality. I wondered if the city and the county could talk about what you are all doing from a regulatory perspective to regulate land use, to require stormwater management, et cetera. Awesome. Thank you for that question. Are you comfortable taking that one? I know it's outside of our department, but Jeff's been around, he knows. So I'll talk about briefly, uh, Chris, from the, this, from the stormwater management perspective again, um, and the stormwater manual. Um, so that is the, the state-driven mechanism for uh, you know, making developers and developments happen in a way that is as, as little uh, disturbing as possible. So uh, we will see a new uh, stormwater permit come out for Clark County in 2024. Part of that uh, of that permit requirement set will be to update once again the, the county stormwater manual. Uh, some of those updates are prescribed by ecology, things that they already know they want to change based on the Western Washington stormwater manual so we can be equivalent to it. Um, we also have the option at that time to uh, request or propose additional changes to our manual uh, that may go beyond what uh, what ecology has in Western Washington. So uh, there's a little bit of a back and forth iterative process that takes place there, uh, but it is an opportunity for us to explore, um, you know, expanding ways that we might uh, look for better solutions or better outcomes. Um, that, and, and then just to reiterate all the things that, that is already in place and will continue to be in place is that phosphorus treatment uh, requirement for all new development that takes place in Lackland's watershed, um, which I think is, is one of the drivers and some of the improvements that have been seen over the years, and, and some of them that we want to continue to work uh, forward on. Great answer. And just another thing we're working on right now. 
Yeah, thanks, Jack. So uh, essentially, ditto on the stormwater part for the city, right? Uh, very similar regulations that uh, we are responsible for in the city as well from a stormwater standpoint. The question um, that we get asked often is uh, around the North Shore, right? That's uh, fairly undeveloped right now. Uh, and there's been a lot of discussions around it with the sub area plan uh, over the last couple of years and what development's gonna look like over there and what's the city doing about it to protect the lakes. Um, partly um, over the last few years, the city's been undertaking the you know, legacy lands project. Uh, and that's essentially where the city uh, purchased, you know, I think overall we're up to about 100 70 acres total on the North Shore that the city owns. So part of that was around the vision of the community to um, uh, protect the backdrop of Blackness Lake was usually the language that was used. And so part of it was from a kind of an aesthetic uh, nature uh, preserve standpoint, if you will. And then with that just naturally comes the stormwater component as well. So we have a, a very large buffer uh, along the entire north shore of the lake that the city owns and will you know be able to protect moving forward. Um, the other piece of it is this on the north shore is that the same stormwater regulations that are in effect for the rest of the city will apply on the north shore uh, and stormwater regulations continue to improve right in this context from a protection standpoint and so that's that's going to be the number one way uh, as development occurs on the North Shore is that we get to make sure that they, uh, anybody who develops up there is going to meet our stormwater regulations, which includes phosphorus treatment and uh, everything else that goes along with that. Thank you. And I do have a question online, um, and I might actually be able to answer this one and then also hand it to Steve. Um, the question is, the county and the city are planning again to enter an interlocal agreement. What are the specific requirements of the county for that agreement and for the city for that agreement? And that is a great question. Um, so I will back up and say that um, last month, was it? it, it we just um, were at council, our county council, to ask permission for the county to enter an interlocal agreement with the city of Camas, and we got approval to do that to formalize our relationship and working together and what our roles and responsibilities will be for the watershed and lack in this lake going forward. Regarding what are the requirements of that interlocal agreement, we are at the beginning of that interlocal agreement and there will be many conversations and negotiations probably about what that looks like and how much funding we're able to bring to the table, who is doing what, but the good news is, is that we have council approval to enter that interlocal agreement and have had that approval and support for a long time. Um, do you want to add anything else, Steve? Yeah, not much. Um, again, same thing from the city's perspective, the council is uh, certainly on board with uh, moving forward with an interlocal agreement. I think the biggest thing is it goes back to the longevity, right? If we can um, kind of formalize some of these partnerships with a lot of these uh, agencies sitting at the table over time, and whether those are agreements or some other form of commitments, right? I think that's the key is that just long-term partnerships are what we need to do here. And hopefully if the city and county can take the lead in that um, and then wrap others into that fold, I think all the better, right? We're gonna be more successful if we can do that together. So I'm, I'm sorry we have less people here, uh, but I don't want to spend on a bad note. And it's hard to say this in a positive way. But I was the counselor trying to push and lead the consortium of all stakeholders and to get the agreement together with Camus a number of years ago. So I was extremely disappointed when the camp when Camus pulled away. So I want to say something, you know, what, what I am going to push for with our council, and I'm hoping to have the support of all of them, is that we're part of the so stakeholder group making decisions on how to move forward. We had a great presentation by the consultant. I appreciate that. There are other consultants out there with other opinions. 
And I would like to see oxygenation as a part of this solution, not just something not recommended at this time. So we, we need to be part of the decision making process, not just someone who can, uh, we can go through and have testing done and have our county resources, grant opportunities. All of us in this room need to have a role in impacting the restoration plan, which I really look forward to, as well as the rest of the ecology study. And I, I want to frame it in this way. I don't know how many people in the room were alive in the early 60s, but we're going to the moon in the next 10 years before the decade is out and return safely back again. John F. Kennedy said that, and he initiated the whole of government to get exploration to the moon at a time when we didn't even have a pocket calculator that had been doing. This is not a moonshot. We need to see progress. We need to have short-term girls and measurable steps that we can do right now. The public demands it. And that's what I'm you know, on the edge of. I mean, I have to answer to constituents. I want to see steps taken. We need to can, can complete all the studies. We need to come up with a restoration plan. In the meantime, we need to take concrete steps to stop the nutrient load whether it's nitrogen or phosphate, and we need to start eradicating and, and removing in whatever way we can. We need to see them. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that we can all take that uh, to heart and realize we need action now, as hard as it may be. We're not going to make the lake worse. We're going to make it better with each and every step. And I, I was sad to hear you reflect that in your opening comments that we don't want to make the lake worse. We want to make it better. We don't. So that, that's what I hope to impart in, into that agreement with Camus and everyone else in the room. We all have a voice and we're all going to take concrete, concrete steps forward. Thank you, Pastor Medici. And he has been one of our biggest voices. I remember early on when we had that coffee back when I was at Ecology and you were talking about the lake, talking about your interests and how are we going to move this thing along. And I appreciate that you stayed committed this whole time and supportive of the process. And I think with the interlocal agreement too, it's just, it's not just the county and the city. It's everyone in this room. You know, the county and city can only do so much. We need partners to help with implementation, working on public lands, working with private landowners. And we heard examples today from Watershed Alliance and Park Conservation District and others who spoke up in the room. Everyone has a role. Now we just need to make the money roll in, right? Um, any final questions or shall we move to our final remarks? Seems like a good time for final remarks. And we can end a little early. Um, on behalf of Clark County, I just wanted to thank, again, our Clean Water Commission for putting together this event. Thank you to the city of Camas. Thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to everyone who came and stayed. Thank you to Kaylee and Haley. Thank you to Alice for lunch. Um, there was a lot of moving parts, and I hope that we can continue to have many events like this going forward. So now I'm going to invite um, our new Deputy Public Works Director, and our campuses public works director, I guess, to start with our closing remarks. That was going to be my first comment, actually. She's done, uh, right in the last break, I actually told her, too, that uh, throughout the day, she's done a great job, but that also includes over the last month or more of uh, coordination on all these activities. So thank you, this is awesome. Um, I have just a couple of closing thoughts. One from a city perspective on the lakes management plan. Uh, again, it's up on our website right now. If you don't have a copy of it, um, you can find it there. You can email me and I can send you a copy or tell you where to go get it. 
we are trying to get comments from folks right now. And this is everybody I've been answering questions and taking comments from the general public. We have uh, agency comments out there right now, but trying to wrap that up probably in the first week of November. So I think by it's at the end of next week, essentially, I think uh, if my dates are correct. So that would be the idea just to kind of get the initial round of comments. We'll go back, we'll finalize things. Uh, from a, a draft standpoint, get that submitted to ecology and then kind of continue that iterative process to, to kind of finalize that effort. So I want to just encourage everybody to take a look at that and provide comments if you like. The other thing uh, for today, I would just say this has been awesome. Um, Roger, wherever you're at right now, I hope appreciate this. I can tell everybody that Roger has been uh, bugging me at least for probably the last couple of years and trying to get something like this pulled together. Um, you know, I, I think the timing was right right now, right? We have everybody, we have some technical data and some science available. We've got uh, momentum behind this. So this has been, uh, I think, a really great day. Um, you know, what I would talk about at the end here is just our relationships, which from I feel at an agency to agency perspective, whether that's staff or whatever, however you want to say that, it's, it's been great over the last two or three years. Uh, I think everybody is committed to this. And I think that's what I would hope that some of the city and the county together that we can, uh, part of our commitment might be that we try and continue these efforts, right? Um, obviously, maybe not at this level, on a regular basis, but from a staff perspective, right, a technical standpoint, we try and get people together on a regular basis, talk about what it is that we're doing in the watershed uh, and how we can continue to partner with each other. Part of that's gonna be, um, again, supporting ecology and their efforts in the advanced uh, restoration plan. Part of it's gonna be talking about funding, right? All of us have kind of different funding mechanisms that we use or, or grant opportunities that we chase, and so I think if we continue to share those opportunities uh, and talk about that, that is going to be something that we really want to do is, um, you know, let's let's see jointly where we can get the funding and if there's grant opportunities and we can all write letters of support or whatever the case may be, I know we're all always willing to do that. So uh, keep that in mind. And then just sharing the ideas and thoughts, right, on what we're doing and how we might be able to help uh, activities in the watershed, even if it's outside of our jurisdiction, there are creative ways that we can get that done. And so I just, again, would encourage everybody to, to keep um, throwing the ideas out there and, and see how it goes. So I just want to thank everybody for coming uh, and appreciate uh, everybody hanging in there today. All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so for those of you who, are, who have not had the pleasure of meeting yet, I'm Priya Barapal. Um, I can say I'm the new uh, Public Works Deputy Director for Kwa County, um, coming in two months now. Um, after, as a newcomer to this area, I should say that, you know, being a part of this symposium and seeing everybody um, collaborate on this has been a breath of fresh air. Um, or maybe for this group, I should say, it's a sip of pure clean water. Um, and it's been such a delight to be a part of this, you know, so many passionate advocates of uh, clean water. And uh, somebody said, uh, Lachemus lifeguards, I have something to match you. I feel like we are avengers of the apple, apple world. Uh, and we have assembled uh, to sh with the shared responsibility to protect and restore our water resources of clock time. Um, so I want to begin by sending my deepest gratitude to Clean Water Commission uh, for initiating this wonderful symposium. So you've set the stage for something truly remarkable, so thank you so much for that. Um, and also a big shout out to City of Camus for allowing us to host this symposium uh, in this beautiful Blackness Lake Lodge. Um, they welcomed us with the morning refreshments today and also the breathtaking uh, beautiful scenery outside. Uh, it's great to come together right next to the this lake. Uh, as we just said, from the beginning to the water, you see it right outside the window. Uh, I also would like to extend my thanks to Clark County Council, uh, the City of Camas Council, um, Mayor Hogan was here earlier, along with other dedicated elected officials who have taken time out of the day to be, up, to be here. 
Uh, you all have a million things to do, a lot of things demanding your attention, but you prioritize to be here, and that just shows your commitment to clean water and um, that's dedication. So thank you so much for being here with everything that you have going on. Um, and last time we had a council meeting today, the council is to be here. So thank you for this. See you next week. Um, and let's not forget the incredible speakers from uh, the Department of Ecology, the Environment Watershed Council, Watershed Alliance, the Clark Conservation District, uh, Clark County, Clean Water Commission, and I also, the other people who are I'm, I'm going to miss out for the, uh, I think, Lacrimus, Lacrimus, uh, Sherry Partners, the Friends of Vancouver, City of Vancouver, who all came and introduced yourself. Thank you so much for doing that. I'm sorry if I forgot you. Uh, so, I, I, then also, I want to give a big round of applause to the planning team who put this together. Um, City of Canvas, Clark County team, uh, a big shout out to Devin, the MC of today, uh, pick up Splash to Bird Squirrel for this fantastic club. And then uh, whoever was a part of putting this together, can you stand up for a moment, please? So we can recognize the good work that we did. Here's your idea. Thank you so very much. Um, I, I've joined, like I said, I've joined Clark County three months ago, and this has been, I've been hearing about this for three months, and it's been in the plan for a long time, and the last three days, it's been a period of, uh, you know, efforts from multiple agencies, and the planning team especially, to get this to where it was, so thank you so much for that. Um, thanks to everybody who contributed the invaluable time, knowledge and expertise, and And I hope these presentations and discussions that you've had today of the vital role Um, and while our focus today was mostly on the Lacrimus Lake, uh, I, I think the reports of our discussion will extend to other watersheds and lakes in Clark County as well, including our beloved Vancouver Lake too. Um, and looking ahead, uh, you know, like Devin mentioned and Councilor McWilliam mentioned, um, Clark County's Council recently approved the county entering into a local agreement with uh, City of Canvas to implement the Blackness Lake Fashion Plan and also to make progress um, implementing Department of Ecology's sources of and alternate restoration plan. So, Clark County uh, will continue to support the Food Smart Clark by providing monitoring assistance to finance big sources of pollution in the Lacrimus watershed and also identify sources of fecal pollution from. Uh, humans, dogs, or livestock. So this information will be essential to support the implementation of the agricultural best management practices and septic system work in the watershed. Um, so in addition, in the process of progress, our Clark County staff have applied for grants to amplify our capacity to provide outreach, education, and technical assistance on lawn care practices to reduce phosphorus going to the Lacrimus Lake. And we are hopeful that we can increase our ability to help our students learn how to practice how to practice on the lawns, uh, how the practices on the lawns that can have uh, the potential to impact Lacrimus Lake Creek and the Lacrimus Lake. Um, Clark County is investing annually uh, about over $500,000 into the stormwater, stormwater management activities in the Lacrimus Watershed. And this includes uh, the stormwater capital projects, stream health monitoring, and annual inspection and maintenance of publicly owned and private stormwater facilities. And we are definitely excited to do more. And most importantly, we are able to do it all in partnership with each of you to amplify our collective impacts. 
So before I conclude, I want to thank everyone again for being here today. Um, again, we are the builders of the Apple world, and I'm delighted to be a part of this group. I also, again, extend my credit here to the Water Commission, so if you can join me in giving them a big round of applause. Finally, I'd like to conclude with a call to action. So as you drive home today, I encourage you to think of one thing you can do to protect and restore clean water and commit to it. Um, each one of us here in our own capacity, big or small, can make a legacy impact for Lackman's Lake and that could be felt for generations to come. And we need to remember that, that each of us have the power to make the difference. So today was not just an event, um, it's a springboard for a brighter, cleaner future for our precious water resources, and I'm excited to be a part of it and hope you are as well. So thank you all for your passion, your dedication, and your commitment to the cause of clean water. Thank you very much. have an hour for well about 45 minutes for lunch now well done presentation so everyone's favorite time lunch 